Welcome to the May edition of the Tacoma Coffee House, where we'll explore the tension between sports and academics with Tacoma Park Recreation Outreach Director Steve Ellis on Body and Soul. Next on In Sickness and in Health, Dr. Evan Siegel on the aches and pains of arthritis and what can be done about them. Then on Musical Traditions, the original folk rock sounds of Pete and Maura Kennedy, followed by Writer's Block, Patricia Browning Griffith on her latest novel, Supporting the Sky, the life of a single career mom in D.C. On Coffee House Forum, the pros and cons of the proposed inter-county connector between Montgomery and Prince George's counties, plus commentaries by Randy Bain and Haynes Fraser, and poetry by Rose Solari and Norman Green. But first, the editors of the Tacoma Voice have the news. Hi, I'm Eric Bond. And I'm Nancy O'Donnell, and we've got the news. Five months after he pulled the plug on the American Dream Mega Mall project, Montgomery County Executive Doug Duncan announced on April 30th a so-called smart growth plan for re resuscitating downtown Silver Spring. Duncan told a press conference outside Bell Flowers on Georgia Avenue, quote, the revitalization of Silver Spring will be the culmination of a number of projects, not just the development of the central core. The smart growth plan, said Duncan, is designed to curb growth in rural areas and redirect it towards urban areas. Silver, Silver Spring is the first designated smart growth area. Planned highlights include a detailed assessment of the Fenton Street Village, the construction of a transportation center in the downtown area, expansion of Montgomery College, the enhancement of open spaces, and new housing. Duncan expects to name a dev developer for the Central Business Core by the end of May. The Main Street Center, a group that emphasizes a human-scale development model for urban centers, will conduct the assessment of the Fenton Street Village. Duncan has asked county offices to work with the Park and Planning Department to increase the open and green space in the older commercial areas of downtown Silver Spring. The county executive also says he's anxious to hear creative proposals to furnish new market rate, market rate housing that will work in the central business district. Duncan struck a positive note about the future of the often maligned downtown Silver Springs, saying, quote, with the access to public transportation here, Silver Springs should be the prime location in which to locate families. A high concentration of the toxic chemical PCE was discovered in a test of groundwater outside of wholesale cleaners earlier this year, raising concerns in the Sligo Creek neighborhood. Wholesale Cleaners is located at the corner of New Hampshire and University Avenues just across the street from Sligo Creek. A February 19th test taken by WSSC registered the chemical at 94 percent above the EPA limit for drinking water. When Bill Easterly, a member of Tacoma Park Citizen Advisory Committee on the Hiker Biker Trail, found out about the high PC levels, he asked the Maryland Department of the Environment to investigate. Quentin Banks, spokesperson for the department, said that he is concerned with the reading and its impact on the aquatic life. He added, however, that while the reading was high, quote, people don't drink the water in Sligo Creek. And Banks noted that wholesale cleaners was twice inspected after the February reading and both times was in, were in compliance. The question of the PCE's lifespan is in dispute. According to Banks, PCE dis disappears in a matter of months or so. Independent researcher Sean Jeong maintained it can survive up to 100 years, while WSSC environmental engineer and project manager Mike Vitaglioni called PCE a very persistent chemical. Vitagliano said the problem isn't going to be over anytime soon. On Sunday, April 20th, some 20 people joined the first annual Earth Day Bike Around. Participants noted that Tacoma Park is a very hilly city. Part of the journey passed over the newly constructed bike trail along Sligo Creek Parkway. Dan Robinson, president of Sligo Computer Services, a co-sponsor of the event, pointed out the depletion of wild growth along the creek due in part to the very bike path riders were using. Robinson also noted the riprap installed along the banks. Riprap is the name environmentalists give to the anti-erosion boulders that now line the sides of the waterway. These stones heat up in the summer and kill off the wildlife. Further down Sligo, past the Tacoma Park border, the creek ends and the water is channeled into a cement ditch. The bike around lasted approximately two hours, beginning and ending at the gazebo in Old Town. The Tacoma Voice also sponsored the event. On July 1st, the City of Tacoma Park plans to hold the mother of all parties at the Tacoma Langley Shopping Center to celebrate the long-awaited unification of the PG County part of the city into Montgomery County. Music, food, political speeches, and clowns are scheduled. 
City Council Member Bruce Williams is enthusiastic about the site. Other city residents are unhappy that a strip mall accessible only by car was chosen to celebrate the long-awaited unification of Tacoma Park. Liz Lerman, director of the renowned Dance Exchange, has brought a unique vision to Tacoma Park. The troupe's new home is 7117 Maple Avenue. Unlike most dance companies which use young athletic dancers, Dance Exchange mixes dancers of all ages from 18 to 73. Lerman's work has been called revolutionary and probing for the way that she, uh, for the way that she joins spoken work with movement. Most notable is her use of senior adults. Their gestures replace youthful physicality. Managing Director David Minton describes Tacoma Park as good for the troop. Quote, the community is just right for Liz. Warm, down to earth, it, it, gives, it has so much to give, says Minton. Liz Lerman's Dance Exchange offers training for adults in dance, healthcare, education, and other artistic disciplines. The 10-member dance troupe conducts residencies around the world. For more information about local performances and dance classes, call Liz Lerman at 301-270-6700. Lee Avenue resident Bill Schickler thinks hunger and poverty aren't an inevitable, and he's out to convince you as well. A truck driver for Glidden Paints for 21 years, Schickler has bankrolled a TV series called Media Watch and Hunger and Poverty for over two years now. The talk show airs several times a week on public access channels around Washington, including on Channel 54 on Thursday and Sundays and on Channel 49. Schickler said that he got active against hunger 20 years ago when he concluded that the technology exists to feed everybody on the planet. He says that people tend to ignore hunger because they feel they can't do anything about it and because they lack information from the media. Quote, poor people don't have PR firms, observed Schickler. Schickler urges viewers to take action, such as asking for more media coverage of famines, like the one currently taking place in North Korea. Or Schickler suggests join an anti-hunger organization or pursue a career in nursing, health, agriculture, or preventative medicine. The Tacoma Park Farmers Market has caught the attention of the feds, and no, don't worry, it's not under scrutiny by the DEA cannabis warriors. In an initiative to promote farmers markets around the country, a delegation from the U.S. Department of Agriculture visited the Tacoma Park Farmers Market on Sunday, April 27th. Tacoma Park resident Rudy Arredondo, a member of the Civil Rights Implementation Team at the AG Department, said that farmers markets like the one in Old Town, Tacoma, help small farmers stay in business. We simply want to make sure that programs get down to real people, said Arredondo. By promoting farmers' markets, he said, we hope to give small farmers who use healthy growing methods a better chance to compete. Tacoma Park's farmer market is held Sundays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Laurel Avenue in Old Town. The midweek market is on Wednesdays from 4 to 7 p.m. on the city lot, Carroll Avenue at Tacoma Junction. Tacoma Park, long known for its annual folk festival, also has an annual jazz festival organized by Boogie Woogie piano player Dave Lorenz. The second annual Tacoma Jazz Fest will take place on Sunday, May 11th at the Tacoma Park Middle School on Piney Branch Road. The festival will start at 11 a.m. and bebop till after 8 p.m. A smorgasbord of regional talent has been assembled to please every jazz palette. Admission is free and open to the public, so bring your blankets and folding chairs or pay an entrance fee and you can sit under the big top. Along with the smooth sounds will be crafts, persons, artists, and sculptures will display their creative efforts. And yes, there will be plenty to eat and drink. Again, the date of the Jazz Fest is May 11th, Mother's Day. So show mom how cool she is and bring her under the big top for an afternoon of hot jazz and cool folk. The big question around town these days is, who will get the Sammy? On May 18th, the Tacoma Voice and Sligo Computer Services, in conjunction with the Tacoma Foundation, will host the first annual Azalea Awards. Outstanding members of the community will be recognized for achievements that benefit Tacoma Park. Efforts like the Sligo Creek cleanup, the Orange Hat Patrols, and the Maple Avenue cleanup will be recognized. The Azalea Awards will be presented between 4 and 5 p.m. on May 18th. The Tacoma Voice newspaper will present the Sammy to the citizen who has best carried on the activist traditions of the late Mayor Sam Abbott, a tradition of instigating social change, albeit in a som sometimes irritating manner. Before that, from 3 to 4 p.m., the Tacoma Foundation will award its spring financial grants. Refreshments will be served. Again, that's Sunday, May 18th at the Sam Abbott Citizen Center, 7500 Maple Avenue. And that's the news from the Coffee House. I'm Eric Bond. And I'm Nancy O'Donnell, and we go out with this rite of spring. As dawn crept over Tacoma Park in the early morning of May 1st, a group of dancers gathered to greet the sun. 
to guarantee the arrival of spring and summer, the growth of crops, the bearing of offspring, and the continuance of life in Tacoma Park, across the planet, the solar system, and possibly the entire universe. The dancers are members of the Rock Creek Morris women and the Foggy Bottom Morris men. Both groups are dedicated to the preservation of traditional English country dances. Next up, the County Exec's new Citizens Committee for Silver Spring Redevelopment. Randy Bame asks, where are the have-nots? Followed by a discussion of athletics and academics in Tacoma Park with the Recreation Department's Outreach Director on Body and Soul. Andy Baim of the Gateway Coalition and a resident of Tacoma Park. The County Executive's new Silver Spring Advisory Board is a sad specimen of the class divisions that plague Silver Spring. The 31-member panel includes no less than 10 members from the most affluent neighborhoods north of Boniface Street, four from Seven Oaks Evanswood alone, and six from Woodside neighborhoods. These are the neighborhoods where you find the six-digit incomes, the Infinities, and the Mercedes. Here lives Silver Springs, equivalent of the masters of the universe. And then there's the untouchables, persons who are never asked to voice their viewpoint on county advisory boards. Untouchables come from places like South Silver Spring, where not a single resident was asked to serve. But the untouchables extend to all of the renters in the entire Silver Spring area. Not a single renter serves on the advisory board. And that's not all. Neither of the racially and economically diverse East Silver Spring civic associations is represented either. We may have to live with the masters of the universe, but it is a shame to leave such a large cast of untouchables. Hi, and welcome to Body and Soul. I'm Howard Cohn. In Tacoma Park, we now assemble each year about 200 sports teams for our kids, which means a whole host of us adults are involved in coaching soccer, baseball, basketball, football, lacrosse, and so forth. It's fun, it's rewarding, but simple it is not. For instance, what about kids who show a lot of enthusiasm for hitting home runs but are decidedly lackadaisical about their homework? Should you use sports to punish players for poor grades? Okay, why not? Well, what if your punishment causes a kid to drop out completely? As I said, it's not simple. But we have at the Recreation Department someone whose job it is to wrestle with this sort of dilemma on a regular basis. He is Steve Ellis, the, the Outreach Director, and he's here with us in the studio. Hi. How are you doing, Howard? Nice Welcome, to be Welcome, Steve. Here. Maybe we should call you Mr. Community. Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Community Service. Yes, well, Mr. Well, I mean, your job, your job is really to bring us together. I mean, we talk about community, and here we've, we've hired you now to pull together the kids, but really the, the adults as well, in a way that uh, you know, no, one else, no one else has. What well, we should call you, as you said, we were laughing about this, we should call you the savior, huh? Uh, yeah. No, don't <laughs> no. call me the savior. savior. I'm just trying to help out and put some basic programs together so, and on, together with some innovative programs, hopefully, that'll, that'll give the uh, kids in the Tacoma Park area and also their parents 
an opportunity to participate together and grow from it. And so you work primarily with kids. You pull in some teens, of their parents? To teens uh, and preteens, teens. I also work with seniors. I'm trying to put to revamp the seniors, seniors program, which has been uh, a bit dormant for, uh, I guess, the last year or so now. All right. So we're gonna, we'll talk about some of those programs, but let me throw at you this question I raised in the intro. The, the idea, the, this tension between sports and academics, you and I were talking one day and you said, really, sometimes we go overboard, those of us, the guys like me who are nuts about sports, um, and we forget about the other, the other half of it. Well, I guess it's, it's more uh, uh, this uh, division sort of uh, people either all the way for academics or maybe a little too far into the sports thing. I just feel we're in an age now where uh, academics and sports should need to be integrated and kids can be taught how to manage uh, uh, both their, their athletic and their uh, academic endeavors so that they get the, the most, the maximum out of those experiences. So this example that I was using, I mean, should kid has bad grades. I mean, this came up uh, recently in a, a soccer team that I'm coaching. Uh, his mother wants him to sit out, just have me as the coach suspend him for a couple of games. That, is that a good idea? Well, first of all, I guess in a recreational sense, it's not up to you to suspend him. It should be up to the parent. It, it's on the parents first and, and the way in which they're going to, to raise their children and how they're going to, I guess, use uh, extra extracurricular activities to uh, maintain the balance in, in their child, making sh ensuring them getting their schoolwork done. Um, as the coach, you or I, uh, we're there to basically uh, be a, a, a secondary conduit, if you will, uh, to, to try and, and uh, uh, reiterate the positive values uh, that the parents need to initiate with their child at home. So if, if uh, a child's not doing well in school, if they're in a grading period and the grades begin to slip, the parents should notice that first. And they, depending on what their policy is, may decide they want to suspend their child. But they may c come to you or I for advice, especially if the child has been a part of our program for a certain time and ask us maybe if they need to suspend the child or, or use the activity to uh, as, as a disciplinary tool, how much time, uh, how many games or how many practices uh, should they miss in order to hopefully get the point across. Right, right. I mean, eventually it becomes a, a real factor if a kid's a pretty good athlete. He's got to maintain a certain grade point to get on the school team at middle school or high school. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, I guess, an inter institutional factor right. that, that right. the kids eventually run into if, if they're on a competitive level and uh, a certain uh, athletic uh, uh, sport, if you will, uh, is uh, part of uh, their future desires. If they, they desire to make a high school team, that's one of the realities that one way or another they'll have to come to grips with. They, you have to, in high schools now, uh, you have to make the grade point. Yeah, there's a minimum a grade point of, uh, I believe it's two two point yeah, right. oh. Well, I mean, it's something. I mean, it is something that you wrestle with, I wrestle with, uh, you know, where you strike that balance because it's also a very positive experience. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes kids who struggle in school have a very positive experience on on the field of, of play and you don't want to deny that to the kid either. Right. right. Uh, it, I guess it depends on, on, on the child. A lot of right. kids, yeah, they need the athletics. They need that participation right. uh, to, to really to stay involved, right. to keep their, their keep, stay involved and, 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 and keep them from uh, getting into bad situations. Well, one of the I mean, classic programs that you inherited, and in you've been here on the job now, what, about six months? Actually, no, uh, full-time within the outreach department on May 15th, there'll be a year. A year? Boy, it days, seems like yesterday. <laughs> well, congratulations, mm -hmm. one-year anniversary. Um, but, I mean, you, you inherited the basketball program, the summer basketball program, which will, you'll continue to do, do, but... The Yes League. The Yes League. Youth Exposed and, to Success. And you've expanded that. 
I mean, that's uh, we're looking to expand right. it this year. We're going to expand it. Uh, traditionally, it was uh, basically one age group, 10 to 14 year olds, a group of 72 kids. We're going to expand it this year. Uh, myself and Alex McDonald, who's uh, the outreach program leader, uh, my assistant or my partner, if you will. I prefer to think of him as my partner. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we're going to have twice as, we hope to have twice as many kids, expand from 72 to 144, mm -hmm. two age divisions, 11 to 13 year olds, and also 14 to 16 year olds for that JV, JV class. It's co-ed, it's, yeah. it's always been co-ed, but basically it's been dominated by the boys. This year, I want to get more girls involved. You've got this explosion with women's basketball, right. the pro leagues right. are going to start. So you have these, uh, another level, uh, uh, of that that's going to instill aspirations, new aspirations for uh, girls to, to get involved with the sport, right. to, to introduce themselves to it, and hopefully in some of their minds to, to pursue it to that length. All right. Well, so basketball, I mean, sports and basketball, maybe the most traditional of all the, the sports that you work with, a variety of other programs, though, that are, are going on. We, we have some videotape, which isn't really of a program, but it's funny, but it happens to be the our, videotape we have. Our first summer <laughs> fest, is we're it? Going, we have the, the, the <laughs> summer fest, which we are now watching on the monitor. Um, the, I mean, this is something that uh, took place last summer, and you'll be doing again this summer, That was right? a good deal. Uh, we're going to do it again uh, this summer and expand that also. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to produce a, a mini health expo. Uh, with a gentleman named uh, Ron McKinley, hopefully. Uh, we'll have that part in, over at Piney Branch Elementary School. A health expo featuring uh, uh, different uh, booths and uh, venues on uh, uh, health, nutrition, okay. blood pressure screening, right. uh, cholesterol screening, uh, aerobic demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when, when is this? That's going to be July 26th on okay. a Saturday from about 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., 10 to 6, throughout right. the day, all day. We'll have activities going on outdoors as well as indoors. And this will then follow the summer festival, be repeated in August. Uh, this guy is <laughs> having a lot of fun, obviously. Um, the, um, but I mean, a lot of your agenda here is a community-wide agenda, not so much focused uh, just on tough luck kids or troubled kids. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's where I see outreach going these days, and uh, not necessarily a dealing with a specific demographic, but outreach becoming more of a basic component of hopefully the recreation, the Cone Park Recreation Department in general. And, hopefully each of our programs are going to have that outreach component where we look to bring in uh, youth or participants who may not ordinarily have the opportunity to participate in whatever programs we do, uh, whether it's the World Dance Academy or the Young Artist Program, which uh, we, we began last year on a grant from the uh, uh, Arts Council of Montgomery County. And we were looking to expand from a series program uh, three or four classes during a, a, like two or three months to a year year right. year long year we round a, program. Right, we did a program in the fall on, on the dance class and you now have this uh, this new idea the storytelling program which is going to start up right which yeah, has nothing to do with uh, sports that's a, but that's an idea that uh, uh, one, that I like because uh, one of the great citizens uh, of Tacoma Park one of the, uh, Dana Hoffman is one of those people who has an idea that she's looking to make a reality and through a grant that she got from the uh, Tacoma Foundation uh, it's called the World Entire and it's based on storytelling for uh, teenagers uh, uh, 14 to 15 year olds who have problems in school uh, with academics in terms especially with reading with low reading levels uh, and the uh, the, the program is based on storytellers having a small group of kids and, and telling them stories and getting them to tell their own stories right. and eventually bridging that gap they have through what she, she termed orality, mm -hmm. 
and literacy. Does the spoken word putting it on the written page? Basically, right, yeah, right, getting right. getting kids getting to kids be to able that, to take, take their thoughts jump. and express them right. in the written word. Right. The, first, yeah, first express them orally, and then, and and then get them to write about the it. Word right. Is, um, you're right. 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 very good. Okay, <laughs> I got that point. I got that point. <laughs> well, we're going to wrap up here, but um, it, this is the part in the show where you can uh, make your pitch for for anything. I was saying, you want volunteers or Vol you, volunteers, yeah. people with program ideas. Uh, the thing that really enhances and, and makes the thing that will make the recreation department go are, are the volunteers who can be mentors to the kids through programs and people with program ideas. Uh, just come by the office and see me. I'm there at least part of the time unless I'm not running around from program to program. Call me up uh, if you have an idea we can talk about it. If it's something that that can be done We'll get it done. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, that's it for this time. Until next time, I'm Howard Cohn, uh, just trying to keep body and soul together. Next up, Haynes Fraser takes no excuses, and Norman Green offers a poem, followed by some tips to comfort aching joints on In Sickness and In Health. I am Haynes Fraser, chairwoman of a group known as Friends of Rwanda. What bugs me most when I speak of Rwanda, I am frequently asked, what is Rwanda? Or, why are you involved there? Why not Appalachia? I say, oh, is Appalachia your project? What do you do? The answer is usually nothing. An Appalachian project is fine, I say, but there is suffering all over the world, no place more so than Rwanda. The point is to help somewhere. I choose Rwanda. What do you choose? My name's Norman Green. I'm an uh, artist in Tacoma Park. Uh, I um, do sculpture, painting, and poetry sometimes. And recently I did a show called Common Images of Black Males in which I had poetry in the, sh in the show. And I wanted to read out some of my uh, poems that I uh, did for that show. Uh, the first one is called Energy. Um, okay, here we go. Energy. Energy comes in many forms shapes and colors. Energy is created by warmth and by needs, by the almighty mind, the all-purpose thought, the positive power, the unseen forces of nature, the all-powerful force of the universe, the all-awesome inspiring Big Bang that made nothing into something, and it surrounds me and fills me up with dreams. I'm Kathy Christensen. Arthritis affects 100 million Americans by some counts. From an irritating ache in a knee or thumb or neck, it can worsen until a, an afflicted person can't work anymore or walk or live a normal life. Dr. Evan Siegel is a practicing rheumatologist of Arthritis and Rheumatism Associates and also affiliated with the Washington Adventist Hospital. He's here to tell us how we can prevent this joint disease, or if we already have arthritis, how we might lessen its progression and pain. Dr. Siegel, welcome to Tacoma Coffee House. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, arthritis is not one disease only, is it, as we often think of it? Not at all. As a matter of fact, there are a hundred different forms of arthritis, some of them associated with other diseases, others in a disease in and of themselves. Uh, we like to categorize them into two separate parts. Uh, some of them are considered inflammatory types of arthritis. Other 
are considered degenerative types of arthritis, wear and tear types of arthritis. And what would a sufferer feel, the range perhaps of what they'd feel? Well, the common denominator for all types of arthritis is pain. Uh, the majority of patients will feel an achiness in their joints, often or most frequently with movement. Some patients with inflammatory types of arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, will be very, very stiff in the morning hours, lasting sometimes for hours at a time, later loosening up as they begin to move their joints. The other very common thing is swelling of a joint, and one of the danger signs of arthritis is when a joint becomes red, warm, and hot, and that indicates inflammation. So some people might be in pain virtually all day. From oh, this. absolutely, yes. Although the morning time is often the worst. We have a, a graph here that shows a breakdown of arthritis by age. Uh, many of us think of it as an old person's disease, but it's not, is it? No, it's not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, a, a very large number of people are young with arthritis. Uh, the uh, uh, as you can see from the graph, uh, as people get a little bit older, the prevalence of arthritis rises uh, in patients in their uh, uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, nearly half the people will have, uh, in the population will have the arthritis. The graph shows the number of people per thousand in the population which uh, have some form of arthritis. You can see as you get a little bit older, nearly half the population will have some form of arthritic, arthritic illness. Now, arthritis can really sneak up on us, can't it? Um, my brother-in-law was in an accident and had his neck photographed for whiplash. No whiplash, but he discovered he had arthritis and he didn't know about it. Oh, frequently that's the case. Uh, we can uh, uh, often uh, find signs of arthritis even in joints that don't hurt early on, but they really need to be paid attention to once the pain sets in. Is it really important to catch it early, or what if someone waits a couple of years and not sure they've got it? What's the benefit? Treatment is often much more effective when it's caught early, uh, particularly when we talk about exercises to try to prevent arthritis progression. Uh, those usually work much better early on. We like to build up the muscles around the joint, and that often prevents the progression of degeneration of the joint tissues themselves. So if someone has a suspicion they may have arthritis, what should they do? Well, it's very important if you suspect that you have arthritis to see a physician early. Sometimes just some routine recommendations such as exercises, as I was saying, or uh, local modalities like heat and ice. Uh, sometimes uh, there are some local creams that can be very helpful uh, to treat mild arthritic symptoms. Most importantly, we try to teach people methods of performing their daily activities that will not put a lot of pressure on the joints so that there will be less progression. The other thing is that with inflammatory types of arthritis, uh, progression can be fairly rapid to more joint destruction as time goes on. If we catch it early, we can stop the inflammation early on and prevent destruction of the bones which later lead to deformities. So in inflammatory types of arthritis, where there's redness and warmth and swelling, we really hope that people come in early so that we can stop the destruction. So if I came in to you and said, my elbow's a little strange, maybe I have arthritis, what would the test be that you'd put me through? Well, the most important thing is to do a good physical examination and take a history of how the pain began and how the symptoms first started. A lot of times that will give me a tremendous clue as to what type of arthritis it is and what the prognosis is going to be. We next will do some x-rays usually of a joint. That will tell me how much destruction, if any, there has been within the joint already uh, and also give me a clue as to the type of arthritis that we're dealing with. Uh, lastly, we often will do a series of blood tests because there are some factors in the blood that will help us to determine whether we're dealing with an inflammatory arthritis, which is likely to progress more rapidly, or non-inflammatory arthritis like osteoarthritis, which is a wear and tear type of arthritis, which is less likely to progress rapidly. And those dividing the type of arthritis into those different categories help us to know what the best treatment is going to be. Now we have some photographs of different types of arthritis. Um, I hope you can see the monitor where we'll show them. And uh, could you perhaps describe what we're seeing? Uh, yes, the first type is osteoarthritis. Uh, as you can see, the uh, major joint 
problems are at the end of the joints. We call them the distal interphalangeal joints. Uh, often the fingers become very knobby. Uh, and uh, uh, many people, when they look at their hands, will see the, this knobbiness at the end of the fingers. This tends to run in families. We didn't realize this uh, a number of years ago, but there is a genetic component to this. And uh, people whose mothers or aunts have or women whose mothers and aunts have those types of changes in the fingers will often also develop those in later years. Could the hereditariness spread to perhaps instead of fingers they may have knee joint problems? Absolutely, or? yes. We often see it in other areas as well. Uh, the this, this other picture shows a different kind of arthritis. Yes, this is rheumatoid arthritis. It can, you can really differentiate this from osteoarthritis by the pattern of joint involvement. You can see here that the wrists are somewhat swollen. The uh, uh, joints closer in on the hand than what we often call the knuckles uh, right near the palm of the hand are mostly swollen and the proximal joints, the joints uh, in the middle of the fingers tend to be more prominently involved. And we have another photograph of knees. Uh, this uh, is a patient with osteoarthritis of the knees. Uh, one knee is involved here and this is again a wear and tear type of arthritis often not associated with a lot of inflammation, uh, but a lot of destruction of the bone and the cartilage. Often there is then an asymmetry of the bones so that uh, uh, the uh, joint doesn't work as well as it did before. Do we know what causes it, why somebody may avoid it entirely, another person be stricken? Well, we don't really know the exact cause of most forms of arthritis. We know in osteoarthritis, it truly is a wear and tear type of process with progressive degradation of the cartilage within the joint and then the bones rubbing together and almost through friction dest destroying the tissues within the joint. Uh, in uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other types of inflammatory arthritis, we really don't know what starts the process, but we know that there's a genetic component and that probably something in the environment triggers an immune response. These types of arthritis are uh, an overactivity of the immune system. The immune system is really there to determine what is our self and what is not our self. In arthritis problems like rheumatoid arthritis, the immune system becomes overactive and begins to attack the lining of the joint, causing inflammation. Uh, that can then destroy uh, much of the uh, uh, joint space. We have a final picture here of a very unusual kind of arthritis. Yes, this is a very timely process being in spring. Uh, this is the rash of Lyme disease and I'd like everybody to look at that very carefully uh, because we should be watching for it now. This is the rash that develops after a tick bite. Uh, it's called erythema chronica migrans and it uh, starts as a small little red uh, rash that then grows larger and larger, often looking like a bullseye by the end. Uh, if that is left untreated, then it can go on to form many systemic problems, one of them being a chronic arthritis, other problems involving the heart, nervous system, and others. Um, you've said that exercise is very important. Briefly, what other things can we do to prevent it? Uh, to prevent arthritis? Well, yes. uh, joint protection is very important. I like to tell people to try to avoid activities that cause strain and stress on the joints. Uh, things like straining to open a jar can become uh, uh, very uh, damaging to the joints. Uh, carrying heavy objects, uh, repetitive weight-bearing exercise uh, sometimes can cause uh, more increased damage. Well, we're running out of time here. It's been very interesting having you. Thank you very much. Painfully, that's all we have time to talk about arthritis. Thank you to Dr. Evan Siegel for joining us on Tacoma Coffee House and sharing his expertise. In sickness and in health, I'm Kathy Christensen. Coming right up, musical traditions featuring the folk rock sounds of Pete and Maura Kennedy. TV. Oh, 
He ain't nothing like you or me He ain't nothing like you or me Life is large Bigger than the both of us Life is large All you need is just a little trust Be yourself and stand your ground Don't you let nobody turn you around Life is hard I knew a woman She lived in our town She had a bad situation It nearly took her down Ooh, and then one day, I guess it just got old Well, she packed her bags and hit the road Filled the tank and took control Life is large, bigger than both of us Life is large, all you need is just a little trust Be yourself and stand your ground Don't you let nobody turn you around Life is large You've only got one chance to walk this line If you should get lost or stuck in time Just believe this road does not end here How do you want to be remembered A raging fire or dying Life is large, bigger than the both of us. Life is large, all you need is just a little trust. Be yourself and stand your ground. Don't you let nobody turn you around. Life is large, life is large. Life is large Life is large That's Pete and Maura Kennedy. I'm David Eisner, and this is Musical Traditions. We'll hear more music later from Pete and Maura in just a few moments. But first, let's learn a little something about them and their music. Welcome. Hey, Dave. Hey, what should we talk about? It's springtime with the Kennedys. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what's coming up for you guys? Uh, heard something about a studio. You're building a studio? That's what we've been doing the past few months is um, we got a beautiful house out in Reston in Virginia and um, we're building a studio right there that's going to be kind of a haven for singer-songwriters and acoustic type instrumentalists and uh, stuff like that. It's a great setting with the lake and So what you'll be on. doing is people you really want to do. It's not a it's not like you're going to put a shingle up in front and say record here. No, it's not a commercial studio. It's yeah. like a little production suite, you know. Similar to maybe what David Grisman does uh, with his yeah, right. Jerry Garcia mm -hmm. things that he did. Yeah. Right. Great. Great. How'd you guys meet before you were the Kennedys, before life was large? Uh, when life wasn't quite as large. Life was medium. Life was, how'd you meet? Well, I was living down in Austin, Texas, and playing in a band down there in the hill country of Austin. Um, and Pete came through town, and a friend of mine worked at a bar called the Continental Club. And she told me that Pete was coming in and playing a set there, and that I really ought to check this guy out. So I took her advice, and I went down to the Continental Club 
And uh, Pete was awesome. I just sat in the front row with some friends of mine, and they were all kind of chit-chatting. And Pete started to play, and I just moved away from the crowd and sat right up front. And, and I was really into his guitar playing and his songwriting, too. So that's where we met down in Austin. And our, actually, our first date was we both drove to Buddy Holly's grave in Lubbock, Texas. So it was a good very romantic singer songwriter kind of first date spare me the details because <laughs> you never know who's watching um, tell you what can we hear another song yeah i, I know I'm, sure. I'm i'm rushing right into it but uh let's do you it give us some more all right okay well, pete and mora will be appearing at the herndon folk festival which is later this month that's the memorial day weekend and i'm sure as we get closer to the event you'll see uh advertisements as to the exact time so now let's take it away with uh, Pete and Mora. There's a cold wind whipping all around my face. Sunday just doesn't fit this place. I don't know why I feel so strange. Maybe some things never change, baby Out on the scene since you hit 15 By now you know the whole routine Take the double A and walk across Spring and green but you still get lost, baby Just another Sunday going nowhere Sitting on a bench in St. Mark's Square Had a few plans, but they all fell through Cause there's nothing to win and nothing to lose, baby It's St. Mark's Square Hey, I'm gonna make it out of here someday Catch a yellow cab down Avenue Lake Gonna shake it loose for a change my mind Turn around and look back one more time, baby It's St. Mark's Square Just another Sunday going nowhere Sitting on a bench in St. Mark's Square Just another Sunday going nowhere Sitting on a bench in St. Mark's Square Well, okay, um, we're going to come back and talk with Pete and Mora just a few more seconds and get back into some music. Um, let's talk for a minute about recordings. Uh, you got some albums out. Now, the, tell me, the St. Mark's Square, what recording is that on? That's on our latest record, uh, Life is Large. Okay. And of course, we opened with the title song right. for that, Life is Large. And before that, um, what's counting back, what's the one second most recent, we would say. Uh, our first record together as a right. duo was River of Fallen Stars. That's our first record, and it was the one right before Life is Large. Right, and that's on what label? Green Linnet Records. Right. It's been a good label for you? Yeah. Been great, yeah. Lots of touring? Lots of touring. Yeah. We've been on the road really for the last two years all the time. That was a big fear when, uh, when we in Washington heard that 
Pete had found someone that he might be moving to Austin, and uh, we were going to lose Pete. Of course, we were happy, uh, but then we were even happier when we found out that you were coming up here. Yeah, I've been a part of this scene for so long. It seemed to make more sense for Maura to come up here, and she fits right into the music scene here. Well, too, we, so we would certainly vote that way, uh, yeah. we being the Washington community. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been remarkable. It's been great stuff. Um, what else is going on? What, uh, what's coming up? We've got recording studio, uh, new recording we're working on. You yeah. You do the next one maybe in, the, in your own studio? Right. That's one yes. of the main reasons for building it is to do our own recording because it's really different from going into a studio where you have to be on on that day. Right. When you have it right in your house, you record whenever you feel inspired. So uh, it's really a great way to do it. It's only the last few years that it's possible to do it like that. We can wake up at 3 in the morning with a song idea and just run upstairs and put it right. to tape. Right. Slap it down. Dream come true, basically. So we'll sound really sleepy on our records from now yeah, on. Yeah, we'll be maybe like Cowboy Junkies or something. <laughs> <laughs> so right. I always keep turning the volume up, but it never gets any louder. So it's, it's a very bizarre thing. Um, let's see. Why don't we do one more song? Yeah, great. Um, what do you want to do? What are you, you going to do? We'll, we'll, well take we, the segment home, as they say. We haven't done anything from the first record Let's yet. see the title song from the first record. All right. Title Cut Fallen Makes Sense. Stars. Okay, that's about all the time that we uh, have to yak with Pete and Maura, uh, because it's much more interesting, actually, to hear them play um, instead of hearing me yak. So uh, I'm David Eisner. Uh, we'll see you in a month or so. And right now, Pete and Maura will take us home.
Stay tuned for Writer's Block. Novelist Patricia Browning Griffith discusses her latest novel, followed by the poetry of Rose Solari and the pros and cons of the proposed intercounty connector. 